Welcome to another edition of Coonrod's Corner. Today's topic, strip line performance at millimeter wave frequencies. Now here's your host, John Coonrod. Hello, welcome to Coonrod's Corner. My name is John Coonrod. I am a technical marketing manager for Rogers Corporation. Today I'm going to talk to you about strip line structures used at millimeter wave frequencies. Now, strip line structures have a lot of benefits. Uh, however, at high frequencies like millimeter wave frequencies, they're typically a little more difficult to implement. Now, if you compare the strip line structure to like microstrip or grounded coplanar waveguide, of course, there's differences in the, uh, the performance and also differences in uh, how they react to different uh, material properties. And one of those properties is design decay. So to begin with, let me go through a quick overview of design decay. So the basic concept for design decay has a lot to do with wave propagation. And as you're probably aware, an electromagnetic wave that's in uh, free space zipping along at the speed of light, if it encounters another medium, that other medium, when it's a higher dielectric constant, that does several things to the wave. And one thing it does is the wave does slow down. So in general, a slower wave means higher dielectric constant, or a higher dielectric constant means a slower wave. But we have found out there is something else that can slow a wave down besides a dielectric constant of the medium, and that is copper surface roughness. Now we have several papers uh, that really detail this topic, but in general, a rougher surface will cause a slower wave, and a slower wave is gonna be perceived by the circuit as a higher dielectric constant. And you can do a very simple experiment, which we've done several times, and that is use the exact same substrate and use copper that is smooth on one circuit, copper that is rough on another, make the circuits, test them for propagation delay, and what you'll find is the circuit with a rougher surface will have much more delay, much slower wave, even though the substrate itself is exactly the same. The chart shown here is a summary of a study we did a few years ago where we used four mil thick LCP as a substrate and then we clad it with four different types of copper. The difference of the copper really is copper surface roughness and we measured the copper surface roughness with a non-contact laser profilometer before we made the laminate so we have a good idea, a good measurement actually of what the copper surface roughness is on all four of these different copper types. So we made the laminate, sent them off to have circuits made, came back, we tested them. This is 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines. We used the microstrip differential phase length method. The output is shown here on the y-axis is effective dielectric constant, x-axis is frequency. And what you can see very clearly is the circuits uh, using the smooth copper, the red curve, and that has a surface roughness of 0.5 microns RMS. Those circuits report the lowest effective dielectric constant. The circuits with a little rougher copper, the green curve, 0.7 microns RMS roughness, a little higher effective dielectric constant. And you can see this and you get an idea of what's going on here where the roughest uh, copper is the blue curve and that's a copper surface roughness of 3.0 microns RMS and that's reporting effective dielectric constant that is the highest. And what's interesting here is there is a difference of effective dielectric constant of about 0.3, which is very significant actually. And again, keeping in mind this is the same substrate, there is no difference in dielectric material or dielectric constant of the material. This is only due to copper surface roughness. And a smoother surface, the red curve, does not slow the wave much. And the blue curve with the rougher copper does slow the wave much more. And a slower wave means higher dielectric constant. There is also a thickness dependency for design decay, and that is a thinner circuit is more affected by the copper roughness than a thicker circuit. And you can kind of think of that intuitively, that when the copper planes are very close together in the case of a thin circuit, the copper roughness is gonna have more impact on the phase velocity or the wave velocity. And once you get thicker and the copper planes have moved farther apart, then the roughness has less impact. So the chart shown here is, is the design decay for the RL3003 materials, and the RL3003 materials have an intrinsic dielectric constant of 3.0, and you can see that circuits made on RL3003 with ED copper that's five mils thick, that's the green curve, that has a significantly higher dielectric constant at, at about 50 gigahertz or so, it's about 3.2. And then a little thicker circuits using the same material, the blue curve, that's 10 mil thick. You can see the dielectric constant comes down some. And then the red curve is thicker again, 20 mil thick material. And again, the dielectric constant is lower again. Now, if I would have made uh, even thicker circuits around 50 mils thick, 5.0, what you would have seen is the dielectric constant curve trending to be right at 3.0 because that's thick enough to where the copper planes are far enough apart that the surface roughness is not impacting the phase velocity, and then you're actually looking at the intrinsic value of the dielectric constant of the material itself, which is, in this case, about 3.0. 
As shown in the previous charts, the uh, design decay is actually determined by testing microstrip transmission lines. In the case of strip line transmission lines or strip line circuits in general, they have different effects as it is related to the copper surface roughness. And that's because a strip line structure has four interfaces that is the copper substrate interface where the copper surface roughness is important. And that can be rather confusing, to be honest, when you're trying to figure out a good design decay number for a strip line structure, being that you can have different copper roughness and different interfaces within the structure. So the following chart's gonna show an example of this. Here I'm showing a cross-sectional view of two strip line circuits. One is made as a core lamb, one is made as a foil lamb. These are two common ways of making a strip line circuit, even though there's more ways of doing it. These are pretty common, but what's interesting here is the four different interfaces of the copper substrate where the copper surface roughness is important. In the case of the core construction, we will know, as a laminate supplier, we will know what three of those interfaces are because we know the copper surface roughness of the laminate as we make it. The fourth interface, the top side of the signal conductor, that's smooth and we actually know what that is when it leaves our facility, but the PCB fabricator does a treatment on that surface for bond enhancement and it does affect the roughness. So the actual circuit itself, we don't know exactly what that roughness is to be honest. It's dependent on the printed circuit board fabricator. Now looking at the picture below, the foil lamp construction for a strip line, structure. That's showing the laminate on the bottom, prepreg on top, and also the foil is on top of that. So the foil is unknown to us. It's really with a foil, copper foil, that the uh, PCB supplier will choose and apply to the circuit. The prepreg we know about, but actually the copper surface roughness that we're interested in is just known on two of these copper substrate interfaces. So in this case, the understanding the design decay can be a little more complicated because you have uh, prepreg and laminate that can be different dielectric constants, and also they have different types of copper surface roughness effects as well. The manner in which the uh, strip line structure is made is typically using a laminate and some bonding material that's called a prepreg, or it could be called a bonding film. And uh, these prepregs and bonding films and also laminate sometimes have different properties. So in order to have a strip line structure that is really uh, uniform and having the same properties, normally that has to be done with a fusion bonded technique where the uh, PTFE based laminate would be melted together and it's not only the laminate but also the prepreg, then you have a uniform material. But in this case, in the drawing that I'm showing here, is normally what's done with thermal set materials, where you have a combination of laminate and a combination of bonding material like a prepreg. And what's difficult here for understanding the design decay is one layer of the bonding material on the lower side that has laminate on both sides, that has no copper effect. So the design decay for that prepreg would actually be the intrinsic value of the dielectric constant of that material only but the same material used on the top side of the structure that does, that does have the copper roughness effect, that is actually gonna need a different design decay because the propagation of the wave is slowed down due to that copper roughness. So in this case, I would uh, recommend that you talk to one of our ADMs, application development managers, and get some help with understanding what the proper design decay value is for a structure like this. Strip line structures have many advantages. They do not have radiation. They also have minimal dispersion or no dispersion, which means you can have very wide band uh, applications, very good wide band performance. And there's also excellent isolation. So there's several benefits to millimeter wave uh, strip line circuits. But unfortunately, at millimeter wave, the high frequency of millimeter wave means very short and small wavelengths. And that causes some issues for signal launch or trying to transition the energy from the connector into the circuit board. So there's several challenges there. The chart shown here is the design decay curve for a uh, RO1200 materials, and this material is formulated to be used in high-speed digital applications and has extremely low loss and has very good performance for very high frequencies. In this case, I'm showing the curve from about 1 gigahertz out to 70 gigahertz, and the limit at 70 gigahertz is not related to the material or the structure itself. It's actually related to what I talked about earlier, and that's the signal launch. And in this case, the signal launch was not optimized beyond 70 gigahertz. Besides the strip line structure uh, as a transmission line, you can also use a strip line structure as a resonator, an open-ended resonator. And that's actually been done for many, many years, usually at lower frequencies, microwave frequencies. And there's a lot of benefit for that. Specifically, a good benefit is to use that structure for characterizing materials, where you can get dielectric constant and dissipation factor at different frequencies. Now, there's some tricks of doing this at higher frequencies, such as millimeter wave. And the following slide gives you some idea of uh, some of the concerns that you should be aware of. 
For an open-ended strip line resonator structure, it's really important to understand the feed line. So the feed line is how the energy gets from the connector to the resonator element itself. And that feed line is going to be an open-ended feed line, which means it can act as a resonator itself. And if that happens, the resonance of the feed line can corrupt the resonance of the uh, resonator element that you really want to evaluate. And one way to minimize that concern is to make the feed lines extremely short in length. And if you do that, then that makes the resonance that will occur with the feed lines at a much higher frequency. And if you do it properly, it'll be a frequency much higher than what your resonator element is going to be operating at. Another way to do it is what I have shown here, and that is uh, using grounded coplanar strip line structure. So the chart that I have shown here and the drawing that I have shown here is the top view of looking at the signal plane for the strip line structure. And the resonator elements in the middle, that's the wider structure that's got gaps all around it. And then the feed lines coming in from left and right, they are grounded coplanar strip line feed lines. And that helps to reduce or actually, actually uh, eliminate the resonance of those feed lines. So you can get the energy cleanly to the resonant structure and then the resonator will operate and you can detect the resonant peak. And then from that you can calculate the dielectric constant with the formula shown here or dissipation factor. The dielectric constant formula uh, give you the, uh, the variables real quick. N is the resonant node, C, speed of light. F sub R is the resonant frequency. L is the physical length of the resonator element. Delta L is the fringing fields around the resonator element. Shown here are two screenshots of a strip line resonator. And in this case, it is millimeter wave. So I have responses going out as far as 58 gigahertz. And in this case, you can see in the upper left picture a uh, strip line resonator that has got three different resonant peaks, one at 19 gigahertz, one at 39 gigahertz, one at 58 gigahertz. And ideally, I wanted to have one at 77 gigahertz, but it's not there. And the reason it's not there is because the pitch of the vias used in the grounded coplanar feed line Actually, the pitch was not correct, and what happens is that pitch was wide enough to have a waveguide mode at about 74 gigahertz. And at 74 gigahertz, a waveguide mode kicked in, and what that did is it killed the resonant peak that should have been at 77 gigahertz. So that's another concern to be aware of. And then also you can get dissipation factor, which I have shown here. Dissipation factor is actually a pretty easy calculation. You can just measure the Q, and if it's very loosely coupled, that's the unloaded Q, essentially. And then there's some simple formulas in IPC uh, D24 that could give you reference for the more details of how to calculate that. That now concludes this session of Coonrod's Corner. Thank you for watching. For additional information and technical tools, if you are not already a member, join the Rogers Technology Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more of Coonrod's Corner and other informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Raj mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.